call. I'm super impressed how you pronounce what you. I asked before I am. Good job. It's always fun to see how uh, non-Danish people pronounce it. So uh, welcome to. So uh, let's jump into it. Uh, we have an agenda here today, and first off, let's start with an introduction. So uh, who am I? I am Daniel, here with a beard. And uh, I've been working in the game industry for quite a few years, uh, with a, a background of being more of a level design uh, artist background. Uh, I've been a speaker at Comic Con, and um, several years as lead, until I decided to jump and uh, start with Do It Games. Um, I make go games because I need friends, and of course, we share ginger shots when we can. I worked on uh, several different titles, everything from kids games to hardcore games, even multiplayer games. Uh, but my love, of course, is Steam PC games. So, what is Void Crew? I will uh, play the uh, official trigger. Um, if the is, is sound is too loud, uh, you can adjust it. Then please, it's up, and I'll try to see if I can adjust it via the computer. It's not too loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's too loud. It's too loud? Yes. <laughs> Let's see if. Followers and men. Yeah. Technical issues here. I think this uh, thing actually turns it up, but doesn't actually display it. Oh. Welcome aboard, followers of Medum. Access, and um, we um, had to put it out there, even though there's also stuff we wanted to do left. We put it out there, and uh, we are very happy that the reception was positive uh, to a degree that surprised us. And we have no idea what they're spending nine hours and 14 minutes on in the game, but it was an awesome reception. Uh, we have an active community on Discord for almost 10,000 people. Uh, so all, all we are very, very happy uh, and excited about. Uh, the momentum we got when we released it. So, a long time ago, the Nordic Game Jam, 2010, there was this game that uh, I was uh, on a team making uh, called Gravel Gravel. I think the, the product name was called something with the Dual Rope Physics. And we actually won a jury award uh, because we couldn't win any other awards uh, because we didn't follow any of the rules. So, fair enough, we got something. Um, and uh, that's me. We found we had to dig this thing up. It was pretty hard to find. We actually managed to find these. And the thing here is, it's actually an honor for me to be here today, being a game jammer, and then suddenly today being allowed to be a speaker. So for me, it's been a great journey to be here today. So let's dig in. So where does an idea come from? So it comes from everywhere, of course. But from my perspective, what I wanted to do, I had a, a dream I wanted to do. Me and my brother, uh, I have six siblings, so I play with my brothers online, because we just spread out. And uh, at the time, there just wasn't a lot of games, co-op games. There was this immersion of all the co-op games were starting to show. Uh, the games that were, were kind of similar. Uh, there were very much shooting arenas where you, you were shooting inside and just doing the same thing. And I wanted to make a game that brought people together and forced them to work together. Uh, somehow depending on each other. 
because we all know that person, that player, that just runs ahead. And I can see nodding in the, the audience like, yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> right? um, and make, make them so that they are forced to work together, but in a natural way. So this was the dream. Then at the time, there was a few games, you might recognize these. Uh, this one, I've been playing that to death. Uh, it's from 2012. I think I played mostly the advanced edition. Um, I, guess, I guess a lot of you played this game as well. It's a very popular game, and it's a bit about being a spaceship and organizing the spaceship top down and trying to manage the crew. And I thought to myself, what would it be like? What would it be like if I picked one of those uh, entities on that ship and I was that thing? If I was controlling the ship, how would I invade the missiles that were incoming? How would I dodge? If I was the gunner, how would I shoot? If I was the engine room, how would I fix the, fix the ship and make it work? And at the time, uh, this game also came out, which is kind of similar in nature. It's a platform that you share and you go around um, together. So I was like, you know what? A first person sci-fi crew adventure. I want to play that game. And that's kind of where it all started. It was like, OK, maybe this is a thing. And I kept looking online. It's like, there must be somebody who did something like this. And I just couldn't find it. There were some builder simulation games where the game was about building the ships. And then it was about spending, I think it was uh, maybe two weeks of building some ship that you could play on some physics. And then it would blow up and you have to start over. And I was like, why can't I just go into the fun part and play with my friends on the ship on an epic adventure? So here's uh, actually some of the original concept art. I think it's a combination of several concept arts that I ended up photoshopping together. Um, and is there a laser in this thing? Oh, yeah. You can see there's a person here and a person here. So it's not the best concept art in terms of communicating that it's a crew that was aboard the ship. But the point was, it was about being on a platform and going up against something that was uh, bigger bigger than you could ever think of, uh, of uh, defeating. So it's a bit of a David versus Goliath scenario, where you as a team had uh, insurmountable opposition or obstacles that you together can only accomplish and overcome. So we started working on a game. And uh, this is actually the original teaser video we sent out for getting a publisher. So we had a full gameplay video as well, but I'm just going to share this one with you. It's not that confidential anymore, by the way. <laughs> Based on that, we got a publishing deal with Focus Entertainment. It's a great, uh, best decision ever was to work with Focus Entertainment, his sparring partner. Um, and that led us to the next section where we started designing the fundamentals of the game. So what I'll talk about now is how, what framework did we actually develop the game on. So the vision was, of course, a crew on a shared spaceship, right? Up to four players, which is kind of the standard. Um, that kind of was the, kind of the easy part, right? Players must work together, keep the ship alive. If the ship dies, so does everybody else, right? So we actually just made you, gave, gave you a shared health group. That was enough for people to kind of work together because you can't continue if your buddy dies or that means your ship. So that kind of solved it, and that meant we solved the primary thing I wanted to share with the vision. So that was the easy step. Then comes the three pillars. So um, for those who uh, like you see talks, there's a great talk by Subnautica, uh, people in you know, Subnautica, about how to define your pillars for the game. I re strongly recommend checking that out. Um, it's a little bit inspired by that, so we define three pillars. The first pillar is co-op. And we call it drama because we also want to uh, make sure it's not just about overcoming obstacles, but also creating memorable moments together where 
somebody you know messes up. That's kind of where the blame the crew member uh, mentality comes from. So diving into co-op, we actually made a like a trailer um, for this. <laughs> Hey, can you load void drives? Okay, it's done. All right, let's do the void job. What? No, 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 wait! Space is a hostile environment. Can you come over? I need a hand outside. Sure. Let me open the airlock. Carry out repairs. Explore in zero G and defend our ship. It's hard to know which is the most dangerous. The environment? Aliens? Hold on, I'm still outside. Oh, sh**. Or your teammates. Guys? Hello? So we nicknamed this Happy Accidents. So dying as a crew member is, uh, is not that important. Dying as a ship is what matters. Life is cheap, I guess. So going into the, to the theory, uh, what we call simple, simple interactions. So we, you could go and pick up a battery, you could charge the battery, uh, you could put it into guns to power the guns, uh, you could just sit in the gun and shoot, you can, uh, there's some old pictures here with fires and stuff, and also you can install modules in construction with simple button interactions. Now, the base of this is that you have a beginning player, or a novice player, who can execute player actions like to say two in a certain specific time frame, and they can plan ahead. Like, I'm going to pick up this thing, go charge it, and then bring it back and put it in the socket where it can do a thing. Fair enough. A better player, or who spent more time, more experienced player, can potentially execute more action in the time, same time frame and plan further ahead. So not only can he do the same with the battery, but while the battery's charging, he can run over to another thing, like charge the first two boosters that we have in the game, and return and pick up the battery and back. So basically you get more interactions. The interesting part here is what happens when you start adding pressure. So this is where the co-op starts uh, emerging because you start forcing players to adapt. As you saw, happy accidents mean that not everything goes according to plan. Uh, that means the conditions change. That means that the action that the player was doing either failed or becomes obsolete, meaning the plan that he had thought of also becomes obsolete. That the player ship leaves before he uh, returns to it. Uh, something blows up that kills you that you need now you teleport it back to respawn of the player ship. Uh, that means you need to come up with a new plan. That also means you need to communicate that plan to the players. So they also know that you changed the plans. And the thing is, this is not difficult, it's just when you add too much pressure, this starts going wrong. That means that the other player also has to discard their plans and make a new plan. And this creates this continuous update uh, of um, reiterating your scenario and adapting to the situation. Now, this is not a new theory or something we came up with. This is actually uh, very much used in games for kids. It's because the, uh, the formula is for kids to play with their parents. The kids can jump, but the parents can jump as well, but they can do more advanced things because they have more dexterity in their fingers. So this is a thing that uh, is used widely in these kind of games. Um, so, in this presentation, I also have small nuggets of lessons that we've learned that if you want to and uh, can learn from as well, then uh, play, learn from others and play games. So, uh, running off the co op part, we have a lot of rules. Some games have very specific rules. Um, for us, we wanted to have it, it's actually a very old concept for the characters, we wanted them to be very singing at the time. And then as they would get more cosmetics, they would start to become more unique. Um, but the roles that we had was that everybody can do everything on the ship, so you can compensate. So if you die, then you can just quickly go and do the thing that they were supposed to do. So we defined some roles, some archetypes. So the gunner, the person who likes hitting a gun, likes blowing up stuff, likes to peel layers off the enemies, and eventually likes to stroll just to get some fresh air, so to speak. You have the pilot. Uh, the person who evades missiles, the person I uh, zoomed in on on the uh, FTL ship. We have the engineer, who the behind the scenes person who runs to make sure the buffs are right, that you're not getting nerfed. 
and the tactical officer who handles uh, target uh, identification and uh, strategic assessments and powerful tactical control abilities. So we call this fluid roles because you can always change. Uh, we also have a, a perk system and abilities that allow you to be more specialized in each of these roles, but there's nothing one role can do. So the next pillar we established was tactile mechanics. What we wanted, since we are going from thought view down to first person view, we wanted to make sure we were grounded in that ship. The way we were doing this is that we wanted to have a system-driven spaceship. This is actually a very old slide I'm reusing. Uh, so there might be some data that's updated. But power management, uh, oxygen, charging shields, all these things were handled from the ship and this was maintained by the players, the crew on board. Uh, we have salvage and loot basically carryables that you can pick up move around the ship or loot from the exterior. Uh, modules that are basically functions, like a turret or a scanner or something like that, you can configure at runtime. And just a small detail as well, mods. And you can modify those modules based on um, what you, if you want to fire faster or do more damage or cool faster. So far, so good. Now, the interactions that you would have as part of the tactical mechanics is, of course, the different game modes. Right? You sit down and do different things, and we define them how do they you know, fit into the core part, how do they enhance that. So I'm going to zoom in a bit on the, um, the repairs. So we wanted the fantasy of that person running around, uh, fixing the ship, and feeling like it's falling apart. Uh, Scotty, I think we're going to call him now, right? So Scotty here, um, it's going to just show you running around here and the ship falling apart. Normally you will also have, for these to happen, you have to hit, the ship needs to get hit by enemy fires, or even use camera shaking and everything. But the point is that you can see that the ship can fall apart and you can start fueling that fantasy of being on a ship that's starting to degrade. And all these defects you see, they actually change the behavior of the ship. They increase the power consumption, or uh, how much power output you can have. They decrease the speed of the ship, or the turning abilities. So this way, if they don't maintain this, if you start falling apart, it's going to be det detrimental to their chance of success. Um, to ground even further, one thing we're working on right now is to make it more even more immersive, to make sure that we telegraph to the other players that somebody's repairing. <coughs> into the final table, we have epic space battles. So if you ever like Star Wars and see these epic space battles and like how would it be to be inside one of those, well that's what this pillar is for. The, having the adventure that you can go to think back and go like, remember that time when all those ships were surrounded? That's kind of where that pillar comes in. So how do you get epic space battles? So we wanted quests of course that incentivate that make kind of a uh, incentivized you going on these adventures and having a mission objective. Uh, we have different kind of enemies that would create challenges for players to identify the different enemies. And we have, of course, Scotty, to make sure even though the battle was ongoing, somebody was, somebody's got your back. Somebody's still fixing the ship and making sure everything runs. So one thing we discovered early on, and it was a very old video, uh, with with, which focused on music. So we had a very good uh, uh, music composer called Tools, uh, who made the music for this.
So this was kind of the first kind of prototype we did to see if we had faction on faction support, uh, if we had nature, we had that, that music to build up towards those entities, could we have a build up towards uh, epic space battles. The work continued, of course, um, as we looked into entities. We used some core references, Vermintide 2 and uh, Left 4 Dead 2. We had some archetypes. Um, some lot like these archetypes, some don't. Uh, the hard-coded uh, lock-in-place thing is something that we tried to avoid. But we have something similar. So, but the first thing is that you have something called, they call it Horde in some of the games, which is called the Swarms. And it's basically a basic unit, a fighter unit. Now, one of the things we discovered very early on was just adding these and just having fighters around you cost and effect the players just went like, they're everywhere, which in some instances is fun. But in this case, it actually became decremented to the communication of players. Like, shoot it, what? They're everywhere. There was no communication. So what we learned, thinking back at uh, art school, um, if you have something that's noisy, like this, try grouping them up. And suddenly, many becomes two groups. And that helped players um, actually organize when they were talking. There's a group of swarm over there, there's a swarm over there, and suddenly we saw an increase in communication in players. The purpose of these swarms, the purpose, and this is kind of thing in terms of design, what, why are they there? Well, they're there for attrition gameplay. For those who are not familiar with the, 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 the term, it basically means eating away at the player health, adding pressure. They will not kill the player ship, they will just be there to be uh, annoying and, but, and to be dealt with, but they're not going to be the ones that finish you off. Then you have specialists. We have snipers. So a bit of this cliche, so people can recognize uh, some of these and go like, oh, I know how to deal with that. We have things that uh, debuff uh, the player ship, similar to the one you find in some of the games where they lock in place, but this would only limit you a bit, creating a dependency on players, the pilot and the the gunners, um, and then things like summoners that will start streaming if they saw you and call in reinforcements. So using tropes. Um, and their purpose, of course, is the variation and threat assessment of players. Uh, we usually have our session people screaming, summoner, summoner, or collector, or some other name, and then like everybody goes, where is, it, where is it? And then we try to figure out where it is. So they work as their, uh, to fulfill that purpose. And then, of course, you have elites or mini bosses, where you have armor plates that you have to peel off, or you have the latest edition we have, which is the interdiction pillar, which is basically a static pillar, but it pulls you out um, of void jumping and basically ambushes you. So they create flavors, and you can't leave the sector until it's destroyed. So the purpose of these is, of course, to create, create communication for the players and to have a focus for the crew. A general challenge, so to speak. Uh, so we have more on our roadmap already because this is just people like like these things, including me. Guys. So the pillars um, that we build the game on, uh, and that would be the next lesson as well. Nail this as soon as possible. We actually nailed this a little late, uh, and that ended up costing us quite a bit. So lesson here, nail it. Just one pillar is fine too, but nail it as early as possible because it really helps your team communicate what is important. And you'll have some examples uh, in a bit of how we used it, um, these to evaluate features. So what happens when the rubber hits the road? Right? So we made a design, we made this game, and then we started playtesting. This is a square. Can you guess which spot that goes in? The square. In? That's right. It goes in the square hole. Yes. And how about this rectangle? That one also this one goes in there too. Yeah. yeah Up next, we've got this thin rectangle. The thin rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? The thin rectangle. That's right. It goes to the square hole. And up next, a cylinder. Hmm. A circle. I think that goes in the circle. The square hole. Now we've also got this semicircle right here. Do you see a slot that would fit the, the semicircle? Semicircle. The, sem the semicircle. That's right. It's the square hole. Okay. Up next, the triangle. We know what hole that goes the into, triangle. right? Triangle. That's right. The square hole. And up, la up next, we have the arch. The arch. The arch. You guessed it. The arch. It goes in the square oh, hole. God.
I can relate to her. As I say, that's. Uh, uh, I'm actually quite happy we had a very strong QA team all the, from the beginning because this happens. Uh, so lessons learned. I think the first thing we saw as feedback was the spaceship design. We had made a giant ship, and inside enclosed spaces, it's very hard to make a mental map of how things are constructed. So we spent a lot of time. Uh, you can even see the scale here. Uh, a tiny scale. This is like how big it was at the time. It doesn't feel like that because of the scale of how you perceive in game, but that's actually the scale. And we wanted to make a very big spaceship, and it was actually, I think, the version that has today is very slimmed down compared to the first version of the ship, just interior-wise. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time identifying different landmarks inside the ship, improving those, color coding them, changing the light, uh, having stairs verticality to um, to help emphasize how to run around because we didn't we tried to avoid having a mini map so that people would run around with a mini map. We wanted them to feel natural, look at the environment, and use that to figure out where to go. And it worked. We get less and less uh, complaints. There's still some uh, you need to play once or twice. Then you say, oh, okay, now I kind of get it. That's, that's fair. But we did use this for our next ship, which is a two, maybe three player ship, uh, where we build it around a satellite design. That means we have a central quarter that connects everything. It means you can't really get lost because everything, all the roads need to go, kind of thing. Um, so we learned from our mistakes as well. And we spent a little less, almost no time in iterating on the uh, usability of orientating yourself in that ship. The lesson here is good enough. Right? Um, the big ship, we wanted this to work by comparison to Sea Thieves, where it's an open top. We were like, okay, now everything's enclosed. We just had to solve that challenge and just use all the tricks in the book. Could it be better? Yes. But is it good enough? We think so. So we did also very uh, user tests. We did closed uh, beta tests. Uh, we did those professional tests where um, where people come in, you would film them and, and study them. Uh, that was interesting. Um, and one of the discoveries we did was there's, if you noticed in the one of the earlier trailers, uh, there was this screenshot here of a tactical terminal, we call it. It was the shit, I'm just saying. It was cool. But uh, people didn't agree with me. Uh, actually, it turned out that uh, the people got it, thought it was, uh, it was pretty cool, but most people didn't get it. And that was a lot of it. It was actually a completely different game mode inside the game. And the sheer amount of work needing to make that shipable uh, meant that um, all the stuff we were doing for looking outside the ship was not going to be useful because we had to do the two visuals part. We need to do the one to see outside of the ship, and we need to do the representation of it inside this terminal. So basically, it was an extra game mode inside the game. Um, and that didn't follow one of the pillars. It is directly contradiction to the tactical, uh, sorry, tactical, to the um, tactile pillar. Because you're just looking inside the screen. You're not in the world, you're not inside the ship. So I'm going to admit, this was kind of a darling for me. I would run up and say, I'm going to be a tactical uh, person and uh, do uh, send missiles out and uh, scan stuff. Yeah. Sometimes it's just going to cut and it's going to hurt. But I have to admit, after the emotions kind of drifted away, I could see that it actually made the game better. So kudos to my colleagues for making sure that we made the right choice there. But cutting stuff sometimes um, can make a game a lot better. So, but this had consequence. Because the fourth rule, the tactical officer, okay, where did he go? He was just cut from the game. Um, so we had to say, okay, we need a fourth role because it's the fourth leg co-op. We want to make sure that people feel that there's at least something you can identify with. But there was already a role as we were testing. We also noticed that there was a kind of a scavenger role, the person running out the airlock, wanting to explore and grab loot. Okay, so that's who you replace that with this, you know, the scavenger role. But who's going to do the uh, priorities for the for the, the crew? Who's going to tell what's important and, and you know, the, the captain role? And we were like, you know what, the pilot, he has a pretty good overview. What about him? What if he handles target identification locking? That's a good idea. So this, this, this made sense. But cascading that effect over to the pilot meant that the pilot at the time was locked into first person. You can only see 
uh, left right and uh, gets behind you. Um, and we tried experimenting with like uh, cameras uh, around the ship that you can toggle to see different angles. Uh, that didn't work out as well as I had hoped. Um, and part of this, going back to the pillars, which one did this fit in to keep you in your seat only looking at it? Because the discussion was that we wanted to do a third person camera to orbit the ship so that you could just, you know, turn the camera on and look at what's behind you. Uh, and I was, I admit, I admit it, uh, I was holding on to the thought of being that first person immersion, realistic kind of thing because I've been playing a lot of like these realistic shooters and stuff. The problem is it was not part of the pillars, right? There was nothing in the pillars that said you're a realistic shooter or something like that. So that meant, okay, let's try it out. And we actually ended up having a third person camera for the ship that turned out to be great. Uh, it actually gave that overview that we were missing that the tactical officer was supposed to give in a much more natural way. Um, and that kind of became the captain, the captain role. So we moved some of those target locking, and we found opportunities to make target locking um, a core feature. The, the, the pilot had to assign these targets, alpha, beta, and just say, target alpha. And then they would have a, uh, in, in addition, they would also have a prediction function to help. OK, so this, that, that kind of saw that thing. So lesson here is, and this is more for myself, be open-minded, even though because you're kind of locked on something, uh, but be true to your game. and. Be good with your colleagues or your friends and state the problem and then align it with what you discussed as being your pillars. Now, this has consequences too, because we also are a multiplayer game with a solo component. You can play the game solo if you want to. But after we released the one point, uh, with the first version of the update one, we noticed that fewer people wanted to play solo. And the game was not that balanced towards it. Uh, you play a small ship and kind of do it, and we did it as uh, developers, sometimes with cheats, just to be fair, um, but it wasn't really balanced towards it. Now, here there's an opportunity here. With the target locking, it would be much more accessible to one player piloting a ship. What if we could control where those were aiming? What is the role that you were needing? And one of the roles we identified was the gunner. The gunner was a role that you can't fly the ship and be a gunner at the same time. So could we potentially adapt the mechanic that could be used by solo player and crews? So we actually became a little bit adaptive here because we had planned update one, two, three, and four. We actually made a 1.5 shortly after in adaptation to what we got for feedback. Hello, I'm Daniel from Huggly Hood Games. You know that one friend that keeps you waiting when all you want to do is go on an adventure? Rejoice, dwell no more in the command hub. This week brings update 1.5, Biorobotic Automation Interfacing Neurosystem, or in short, RAIN. An experimental turret only available on the frigate loadout called Lone Sentry. This loadout is ideal for a lone adventurer or a small crew eager to severely overload their ship's power grid. In addition, the pilot now has new responsibilities. Scan distant signatures with a few clicks. Assign target locks to mark priority targets for the brain to Oh, now your friend logged on. Target locks gives the ship's gunners an aim assist reticle, which helps predict enemy movement, making fast targets much easier to track and take down, if cooperation is a thing for you. We know, we know, your friend doesn't help that much around the ship, so we've introduced cruise mode to allow you to tidy up while still going forward, or sideways, or in circles. This update also includes bug fixes, optimization, and quality of life stuff. So remember to check out the update notes. Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah, I'll get back to work now. Madam, preserve you. So we got a very good response on this uh, update um, because we adapted very quickly to the feedback we were getting. Uh, and it just meant that people wanted to play solo good. Uh, and we did that without having to make new mechanics that were only solo, but something that could be shared. So we see a lot of players, uh, two-player crews, using this loadout. So on the topic of adapting, um, our next update is coming, we the biggest today, and we are actually introducing a roguelite endless mode. In our game loop, we actually had um, have a finite amount of jumps, and the jump is a new sector where there's a new objective. The finite amount 
based on a, a model that we were uh, from a different game. When you jump one, you have a choice, do the objective, continue on until you get to the third one, and therefore you can return back and basically salvage what you get for XP and so on. So that is fine, I think the players were getting very good at this. So level where the progression curve or the power curve versus the attrition, the life of your ship, you can't heal your ship. You can repair a little bit, but you can never get back up to full health. That meant that players were just so good at this game, they're just like, yeah, but we're all, we just want to continue at the end of these, these uh, several first ones. So this took a long, hard talk about where do we want to go, and that resulted in people like Endless Move. And we just recently playtested this uh, internally with our publishers. Um, and on the end, very anonymous, anonymous person here, uh, he, said, he said, it just clicks. And this is like the worst, worst unstable version we've played so far. But he said, this just feels right. So this is also for being an early access, being able to identify what people want and listening to the community uh, and adapting to it. So I'm very excited about this. This is like the best game ever. So, um, this is also something uh, in, along in the, uh, the lesson here is adaptation is going to be a key thing when you go into early access. That's kind of the point. So, summary. What does it all lead to? So, we just before uh, launching the game, we went to uh, Boston uh, for the PAX, uh, and we uh, had a showcase at the Focus booth together with some other games. And it was an amazing experience. If you haven't been to PAX or Kongkong, these things are amazing in the US. Um, but we were playing with crews, and they were standing in lines. And they were standing in line for hours. And there was even some that were standing in hour line for hours, and came back and stood for hours just to play again. And there was like a half an hour, 40 minutes uh, demo session. Um, so the reception, there was always a queue the entire weekend. Um, so that's what an amazing experience to get first-hand impressions we have been terrified of putting this out and letting people play it because of all the things we saw. But that was an amazing experience. Now, for those of you who are very sharp, you might recognize the person to my left. This is Lauitz, my dear colleague. He's this guy. <laughs> and guess who insisted on the grappling hook thing? So in the next update, where we're also with the analyst, we're also working on making the, pers the different uh, roles even more um, personalized. The scavenger, the role that, uh, that we got through adaptation and through learning, gets a graphing book. Appetite has left the ship. Gives that a book. That's just, that must be the lesson here. Actually, the lesson here uh, from, is make games you want to make. Make games you want to play. It will give you a lot more energy to see it through than just making a game you think you want to make. So summarizing, play games. You know this. This is like the first thing everybody tells you. I'm saying it again. Pillars. Again, check out the great presentation by the, the guys who made Subnautica. Great talk about pillars and how they had five pillars and they ended up going like, ah, oh, let's not have five pillars, let's have two or something. It's a great talk. Um, being good enough, knowing when that's good enough, knowing when to cut, be open minded, the true, adapt quickly, but above all, make the games you want to make and play. I want to give special thanks. The amazing Roku team who made it all possible and gives us a final, final bonus lesson, which is work with people who lift you up and give you great energy. It makes you happy, makes you want to make this game, and makes you a better developer. Thank you so much for watching or listening. <laughs>